Um, thank you very much to Dr. Sadovnikov for inviting me to participate in this event and to the Weiss family for making events like this possible. You're going to see that deeper in my remarks, I'm going to claim that a, a remedy, we can, we can debate how powerful a remedy, but a remedy for some of what ails our body politic, some of the you know, vitriol, is to create more public spaces, to create space for us to talk about controversial things. And so this lecture series is a perfect example of that. Um, thank you very, very much, and it's a pleasure to participate in that for that reason, for that reason and many others. So, um, Dr. Sadovnikov told you about the Hastings Center. I can't um, resist showing you the Hastings Center. Um, we are um, located in the beautiful Hudson River Valley, and uh, we actually are on a hill overlooking a historic curve in the Hudson River. And uh, this, don't be mad at me, is the view from my window. Um, so don't be angry, um, get even, come and visit us. <laughs> we, have a, we have an open door policy, which is uh, really symbolic of a very active visiting scholar program. So uh, we have apartments, people can apply to do their research and have some quiet, some beauty, and some colleagues to um, hash things over with it at lunchtime. Um, I was invited to reflect on whether and how bioethics can help us make responsible science policy at this particular moment in time. A moment of great polarization and civic discord, of rising authoritarian populism all around the world, vitriolic echo chambers on the internet, and vanishing civility. Certainly, making wise science policy is hard at any time, but it's especially hard in this context. So I'm going to do my best to, to offer some suggestions. But it's important to say from the outset of a talk like this, with a title like that, that the challenges we face are not only because of the terrible decline in our society's ability to talk and think together collaboratively, even if it were the best of times with goodwill and um, a sense of common purpose, even if we had those in place, making wise science policy right now would be extremely difficult anyway because of the nature of contemporary science itself. We are living in an age of transformative technological powers. We're capable of changing the very nature of the human species, purposely eliminating or bringing back whole species, pur either purposely changing other species, um, and even bringing back species that we forced into extinction or, or animals similar to the ones that we destroyed. To all of that, there are advances in information technologies and in artificial intelligence that are combining with advances in the biological sciences, um, with genomics, with neuroscience, um, with reproductive technologies, and with advances in the physical sciences. And this is a convergence that's creating breathtaking synergies. Now, think about when bioethics arose in the 1960s and 70s. The biomedical technologies that were coming online then were primarily life-sustaining technologies like ventilators and dialysis machines, well known on the floors of a hospital like this. Um, they were powerful also. Um, after all, they represented the first time that human beings could control some of the timing and some of the circumstances of dying. Uh, we could allow or we could postpone death, and we weren't quite sure how to use that power. So that, that, they, were, they were a big deal. Um, the poster child for this was Karen Ann Quinlan, and she appeared, I think I have a slide, she appeared on the cover of Newsweek in 1976. Um, she was a young woman in a persistent vegetative state whom everyone agreed would never regain consciousness, and her parents requested that the um, ventilator that was keeping her alive be turned off. Her doctors weren't sure whether that would be killing or not. It was 76. We didn't have a governance scheme yet. And so they requested that the family go to the court and have a judge make that determination. Now, many people have worked for decades since then to build an ethical and legal framework for end-of-life care. It, granted, it's still a work in progress. It's far from being implemented to the, with the fidelity that we would like to see. But there are strong laws and norms that are in place 
They're designed to protect patient autonomy, patient and family choice, and to preserve the highly personal nature of these kinds of decisions. Indeed, two patients with very similar medical conditions can have radically different paths near the end of life, and that's been preserved in the governance regime that we created from Quinlan um, on. Now, in contrast, these newer 21st century biomedical technologies have the capacity not only to extend a single life like that of a Karen Ann Quinlan, but to extend, but to change um, and transform the human species itself. And not only to shape living people, but future generations in perpetuity. Of course, I'm talking about gene editing and other genetic technologies. And as, as I've mentioned, when they're applied to non-human entities like plants and non-human animals, they could also change whole ecosystems and the planet itself. So I want to start by saying a 20th, the 20th century ethics framework, which was based on empowering individuals to make choices that affect primarily only themselves or their families, a small, narrower circle, um, is not going to suffice today because the technologies today are affecting the shared environment a shared environment at a time when we can't talk together about any shared problems. We're not going to be able to rely as much as we have on principles like autonomy. I'm not saying they should go away. In the right context, that's the right framework. But um, we're just, it's just not enough um, to help us deal with how we manage the shared environment. The consequences are going to have implications not just for single individuals, but for others, for others in families, in communities, in future generations, in other species. The, the circle of stakeholders is much wider and the stakes are much higher. So I've tried to think about how can I put my arms around this problem in, in the 45 minutes that I'm going to have left now that I've teed up the problem. So I thought I would organize my remarks in three sections, and I'm going to give you a little taste for the architecture here of these, of these remarks. In part one, I'm going to talk about governance, and I'll say in a minute what I mean by that term. In part two, I'm going to talk about um, the values that I think are need, that we need to engage with if we are going to create a governance structure. Um, and this is where bioethics has a lot to offer, because bioethicists are trained to identify values that are often light, invisible, or implicit. Uh, if you look at how politics works, it's often just fighting over should we should do this or we should do that. There's not a deeper under, under discussion about the values that are at stake and how we might be able to accommodate uh, more of the values that different people um, hold dear. So, so I'm going to have a section that's on the values we need to grapple with given these transformative technologies. And if we did grapple with them, we could begin to answer some of the questions I'm going to pose in the, in the governance section. And then in part three, um, call me Pollyanna. And uh, when I reread what I wrote, I thought, yeah, they're going to really get me for this, especially, especially today when the US Congress is kind of imploding. But I can't, I can't offer anything wiser than the idea that we do create ways for, for us to talk with one another about our shared environment. And I want to end on what I hope is not a Pollyanna, but an optimistic note, that we just have to really lean in to the notion of public participation in making these decisions. Um, I, basically, I'm going to say that I don't think we should rely on scientific or bioethical elites, that there has to be some way to engage the public as frightening as that might seem right now. <laughs> OK. All right, so part one. Um, what is governance, and what should it aim to do? Now, sometimes when people hear the word governance, they hear government, and I don't mean that. Government has roles to play in governance, but that they're not identical at all. Um, rather, I'm defining governance as an ethical and legal and normative because social norms, that's what I mean, framework that guides decisions about which technologies should be developed for what purposes and with what safeguards. So a governance question would be, should we, have, should we allow genes to be patented? 
That's a governance kind of question. Um, should we modify the human germline in heritable ways? Those, they're should questions often, and they're, they're uh, decisions about what we should or shouldn't do or what ends we, we want to stretch for. Governance can include soft governance. So these would be social norms. They could be specialty society guidelines, consensus guidelines. Um, they can also be, um, well, they're, they're generally, soft governance is generally professionally driven with um, peer, some, some sort of peer review. Or there can be hard governance laws and regulations and penalties for uh, noncompliance. It can, governance can come from the private sector, as when companies agree to adopt common safety measures, or from the public sector, as when the FDA says how somebody with a terminal illness may or may not get access to, uh, to, to an unproven drug, for example. Um, in the United States, um, there's been what Sheila Jasanoff um, here at Harvard has ca called a hollowing out of the state's capacity and willingness to exert its regulatory influence. The preponderance of governance here in the US, therefore, is we can't expect it to be, be relying heavily on government for many reasons. Um, but one is what Jasanoff is talking about is like a, a hollowing out of regulation and kind of a, 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 a belief, really, an ideological position that, um, that regulation is harmful to innovation. So in our country, governance is going to likely also include a lot of self-regulation and a lot of corporate a lot of corporate leadership deciding what they will and won't do together. And we're already seeing, and on the positive side, we're seeing some of that. We, a lot of the, um, there's, there's some effort among industry to look at what some of the uh, standards should be for artificial intelligence, for example. Okay, there's also governance in many different parts of the scientific enterprise. So all of us in the room are very familiar with the governance at the front end, at the, at the discovery end, right? I mean, we have IRBs and we have rules about um, how to protect human subjects, how to reduce conflicts of interest. So I'm going to put governance along the, re along the research enterprise, along the scientific enterprise, very familiar with all of that, of how we guide uh, human and animal research. My remarks are over here on the other side. I'm going to be talking about circumstances in which the discoveries have already been made. The knowledge is now available, and the technologies are here, and we're faced with questions about how best to use them. Okay, so actually, I, I'm going to propose that we have four pressing questions. Should the technology be developed in the first place? Now, yeah, it is laughing makes a lot of sense because I sat down and tried to think of a, of a technology where, where we forbade ourselves to do it. And laughing is about the right, you know. I mean, there's three, there's three choices, prohibit, regulate, or go full speed ahead. And I really tried hard to think about examples of prohibition. The only thing I could come up with was that there is an active discussion about prohibiting militarized robots robots that would kill without human intervention. They're actually, so somebody actually thinks it's a good idea to talk about that. Um, a far more common question in the life sciences is not whether, because we seem, to, we seem to not hold ourselves back at all, especially when it comes to biology. We are really curious about ourselves and about all living things. And so, as I say, I couldn't find any examples in the life sciences. I hope maybe one of you can. But, in the life sciences, the more common question isn't should it be developed at all or not. It's this question. If a technology is going to proceed, to what ends or purposes should it be deployed? And I'm going to give you a few examples of how we are grappling now with this question of how, how we should use this. And it's going to come from the thing I'm going to constantly be using as my example, gene editing. I think most people know that a gene or gene sequence is removed or replaced in gene editing with a different variant. And we've been doing this for decades with mice and pigs and sheep, for example. But in the development of CRISPR-Cas9 has really radically changed this. All of a sudden, gene editing became much cheaper and something that could be done in ordinary molecular labs, very little expense. Um, in fact, I even met a woman a few months ago 
who um, belongs to a do-it-yourself club. And she was teaching kids how to uh, use CRISPR to create um, multicolored strawberries. So it is, it is a decentralized technology with ex very, very little governance. Um, and so I don't think we're, anyone's talking about prohibiting it, but we are talking about whether there are lines we can draw uh, uh, regarding ends or purposes. And the example I would use is, is that in 2017, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine <clears throat> issued a long-awaited report, I think I have a photograph of it, um, about human genome modification. And it found that germline modification is likely to bring substantial benefits, but it also took very seriously that there are compelling social and cultural reasons not to proceed with all the possible imaginable uses. Um, it said that if we do allow it, it should be for very, very serious health conditions for which there are no alternatives, and not for so-called enhancements. But there's the rub. It's very hard to differentiate between a treatment and an enhancement. We might develop a gene editing treatment for children with a rare genetic condition, perhaps um, something that causes muscle atrophy. But that same treatment could be turned into an enhancement for an athlete who wants elite status. So once the genie's out of the bottle, it is we may say that there are lines we want to draw, but it will become very hard to draw them. Um, and we're going to need a lot of conversations about which ends we do want, which lines we do want to draw, which are worthy. And if we don't have these conversations, then it will be full steam ahead, that third bullet I had on the earlier slide. And the ends to which these will be put will be based on commercial interests and on um, the, place, the, the purposes that will be developed will be the ones that had the strongest marketing. OK, third question. If the technology is going to go forward, how should it proceed? So I'm going to use another National Academy report as an example of that. Um, this one was earlier, it was in 2016, and it was focused on gene editing in non-human animals and plants. The use of CRISPR in, to produce a phenomenon called gene drives. How many of you have heard about gene drives? They're incredibly powerful. They're exponentially, um, they can exponentially increase the prevalence of specific genetic elements in a whole population of certain kinds of wild plants and animals. Gene drives override, now let this penetrate, gene drives override both Mendelian and Darwinian forms of inheritance. They push what the scientists call selfish genes forward, genes that can be edited in any number of ways to ensure that those genes take over the whole population in short order. They can be used to drive a species to extinction, which could be very useful, for example, for getting rid of invasive species. I'd really like something to take rid of the mustard grass that's just taken over my yard. And for developing plants and animals with certain features, like creating pest-resistant crops. Right now, the major human health application being considered is for controlling or even eradicating mosquitoes that are disease vectors for human illnesses like malaria, dengue, fever, and Zika. You know, it's pretty exciting to think that we could get rid of malaria in this way. Um, it, uh, let's just, I mean, it is pretty mind-blowing that we might have a solution to the millions of people that um, are killed, really, by malaria. The Gates Foundation is, after this report came out, I think Gates was one of the funders for this, by the way. I'm not sure, though. I know this is being recorded, so I shouldn't say it unless I'm positive. Anyway, um, now, after the report, which laid out some interesting uh, cautionary, but going forward, but with, caution, with appropriate precautions. Um, now the Gates Foundation is planning field trials in Africa to eradicate the type of mosquito that carries malaria. And the reason I use this as an example for the third question, like, okay, we're going to proceed, but how? How matters? Is pretty much that's what they said. They said how matters. And what they're trying to do is put some boundaries. So planned field trials in remote areas 
first, you know, in, in very remote areas, trying to figure out what the consequences might be. Mosquitoes fly between boundaries, so, you know, it's hard to do that, but they lay out a methodology that's very incremental and cautious. So they are both embracing this, the potential here, but they're also trying to create an incremental way that we can learn as we try. So, you know, I talked about prohibit, regulate, and full speed ahead. They, I thought were, it was a very well thought through report because it's not full speed ahead, but it's definitely go forward, but just go forward with some thought. All right, the fourth question. Once norms have been set, how will the field be monitored to ensure adherence? And in the gene area, everyone's got very distressed to think about, how, you know, that people could start um, editing babies, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, and we wouldn't know what's going on. So a group has just proposed that there be a registry of all human um, germline gene editing trials that might um, begin. Um, but again, this is probably where our governance system most often falls down. Um, there are lots of sound regulations out there, but there's often very underfunded abilities to monitor and to follow up to see if people are complying. Okay. What am I doing for time? Let me, go, let me switch now to part two. I'm going to skip a little on this, but let's go to part two. So those are the questions. They're not going to be answered by facts alone. So again, bioethics enters because we are trained to start identifying the values that are, are at stake. All four of the questions require a willingness to discuss the values and principles that should guide our answers to those questions. Um, now, safety is probably the least controversial value. It's something everybody definitely wants to be sure that new technologies are safe, and it's not very controversial. Um, although you can get into a lot of controversy about what evidence counts, how much risk is okay, so it is controversial, but the underlying commitment to safety at least is, there, there's no way to argue against the importance of not creating unnecessary harms. Um, it's all kinds of terrible ways people try to avoid responsibility for that, but at the level of, you know, do we all care about this, or sh I think there's agreement we should at least care even if we don't act in accordance with our beliefs. Um, so, let me, I'm going to carry through the, gen the genetics example. In humans, doing somatic gene editing, and, and for those who are, aren't familiar, that's a term used for making gene edits to the non-reproductive cells in the body, uh, not sperm, not egg, not embryo, everything else. Um, and that's currently permissible, and it only affects the person being treated. In contrast, germline genome modification, which makes changes to eggs, sperm, and embryos, create the, her the heritable changes. And it's germline that is not considered safe. There were two international summits. I may be saying things that people already know, but um, just for the record, there, were, there have been really important meetings, one in 2015 and the other one just recently in um, in which it was reiterated that it is impermissible, impermissible at this time to allow germline genomic modification in any embryos that would be allowed to develop. Germline modification can be done up to 14 days in vitro to study human development, but not with egg sperm or embryo destined to become, destined to develop. But in November 2018, this is probably a face that's familiar to people by now, Dr. He Jun Kui claimed that he had implanted genetically modified embryos into a woman and that these embryos um, resulted in li the live births of two little girls. Dr. He says he believed he was following international guidelines, the ones I just told you about. He thought he was interpreting that first report, which said it could be done if there's, you know, no other, if it was for a very serious disease for which there was nothing else one could do. And he laid out why he thought that he had been in line with that. But his actions are illegal in numerous countries, including China, and he's been excoriated by scientists around the world. But that whole debate, everything that has captured attention has been about safety. 
And what I really want to say is let's not forget all of the values beyond safety that we tend not to think about. And I'm going to run through these as quickly as I can. Fairness. Um, the example here is um, if we were, for example, to, to begin to allow the use of germline gene editing, not only to prevent terrible diseases, but also for enhancement purposes, would it be possible to do that in a fair way? Let's, let's presume that there were benefits. I think many of the claims about enhancements are, are bogus, but let's assume that some were going to be really real and they're going to be really beneficial. Are they going to be accessible? I mean, in the long run, we could even create a subspecies if we were not focused on fairness. Um, so, but the interesting thing is, I, this fairness concern actually works in two, two ways. One is we should be alert to how we are creating inequities. And the other way is that if we concerned about fairness, we might be able to design technologies that actually reduce inequities. There's a great example with um, AI in healthcare. Artificial intelligence is now reading CAT scans more accurate, as accurately as expert radiologists, um, and more accurately than lots of non-expert radiologists. <laughs> so, some global health innovators now believe that through AI, we will be able to bring first world radiological services to countries where that wasn't possible. And so it is, this goes both ways. This could, the idea is to pay attention to fairness and to see, make sure we're not exacerbating our already existing inequities and also that we're stimulated to think about how we could creatively use these technologies to reduce inequities. Another concern, of course, is privacy. Advances in artificial intelligence are creating vast networks of smart software that's collecting big data and drawing inferences and in many cases making decisions about numerous aspects of our lives. AI is now making buy-sell decisions in the stock market. It's controlling air traffic. It's managing our power grids. So safety is a big concern because we're giving over so much control to these systems and an error in one system can trigger a cascade effect in all the others. Wendell Wallach has written a book called Dangerous Master where his op opening chapter is a cascade of effects of, the, of a system error that affects another system. But such smart, but again, that's a safety issue. And I want to point out that there's not just safety issues. So in this, er in this space, these smart systems are also raising privacy and surveillance concerns. Um, also, the mining of big data is often used to market products and shape consumer preferences unconsciously, so it has control over us that we may not even be aware of. Um, and we don't know how artificial intelligence is going to work within healthcare delivery, but we know it's going to have a big effect. It's already beginning to have a big effect. If uploaded data from our smart devices reveals that we've been non-adherent in a treatment regimen, should our insurance rates be higher? Um, as expert systems become better at diagnosis and treatment recommendations, how will that change the authority and the, of, and the role of physicians and the doctor-patient relationship? All this down the pike, not really a safety issue. Um, other values at play. Okay. Um, and then, then there's beyond safety, beyond fairness, beyond privacy and control, these 21st tech century technologies are raising other kinds of questions that are harder to talk about. They're, they're harder to kind of put your hands around. And at the risk of trying to categorize them, I was thinking that a good way to describe them is that they affect our, they might, they could affect the, our commitments to the equal worth of individuals, to the equal worth of all persons. So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> I think human rights are at stake. In, so for example, in that so-called genetic enhancements could reflect widespread prejudice and devaluing of persons. If, if, if we did start to use gene editing in ways that were prejudicial, it could erode our commitments to the equal worth of all individuals. And my example would be, and I know this is a long way off, but I think it's not too soon to think about it, that what if, um, genetic predictors for, say, homosexuality became identified. 
Um, if so, parents could make choices to design out homosexuality or other features of the human condition that our society discriminates against. In theory, over generations and with widespread adoption, we could change the diversity of the human gene pool in profound ways that we might not even be able to imagine, and at the same time, devalue people with those features that are stigmatized. So it's harder to talk about that. It can sound very, I don't know, negative, like we're trying to hold back to progress. But I think we need to put all of these things on the table and, and talk about all of them. OK, and of course, we, don't, we aren't anywhere near where we know what the genetic predictors of these behaviors are. But that is coming. OK. Um, I'm going to transition here. Um, I could continue with lists like this of values. And just to show you that I could, here's some. <laughs> Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, but I think I've made the point. And my point is that answering the kind, creating the governance scheme and answering the questions that I've put on the table um, are not just matters of scientific fact. They're not just matters of safety. They engage a whole array of very deep values that are sometimes even in conflict with one another and require um, balancing or prioritization. Because of their complexity, the urge might be to leave these discussions to the experts, scientists, bioethicists, social scientists, experienced policy makers. I understand that urge. Many days I feel it myself. But, and not but, and I feel it because I can see the rising anti-intellectualism. I can see the rising lack of scientific literacy the high internet use where there's myths and worse. Um, and so maybe these shouldn't be made by elites. But I'm going to argue, at least for the time being, <laughs> with hope, <laughs> that circling the wagons like that and leaving these questions just to the experts um, isn't the best thing for us to do. I mean, we. We're, in a way, we're already headed there. In the short term, we're, we're kind of already headed there because um, we have some pretty dire e existential, even existential threats. I mean, some people are arguing that climate change is so dire that forget about getting consent of the governed. Let's just start making some changes to, to save ourselves and our planet. Um, and in vaccine policy, we're already seeing New York State taking quite dramatic actions to quarantine people who have refused to get vaccine. Very um, big things going on in New York right now as a result of vaccine denialism. So in the short term, my vision of public participation in democracy is maybe not going to be in the forefront. Um, but I hope that these are exceptions, and I hope it's the short term, and that we don't give up on the long term. Because in the long run, we just can't afford to close the wagons. We need to build far more robust ways to educate, engage, and be willing to be guided by members of the public. And so that's part three. Um, nearly, oops, nearly every major bioethics publication of the last 30 years, um, whether it was on gene drives or genome sequencing or neuroethics, um, or, vaccine, or the development of vaccines, there were some very important commission reports on that. They've all almost end with this ritualistic last chapter on public engagement. They all call for it, and they give some rationales, but they don't really, we don't really know how to do it yet. I'm going to give you some examples of some promising models, but they all call for it. And the justifications that they give are to increase public understanding of science, to allow scientists and policymakers to learn from the public, sort of a two-way view, um, enhance the legitimacy of the policymaking process, and produce more just outcomes. But I think most importantly, um, the reason to do this is that it's essential for a healthy democracy. There's a long tradition in political science and democratic theory that holds that 
Engagement is a cornerstone of participatory democracy. A healthy democracy, according to, the, to this view, requires much more than voting. We tend to really give a lot of weight to voting. Um, John Dewey recognized that education is important to democracy because education creates the possibility for informed discussion among free and equal citizens. And he viewed informed discussion as just as crucial as voting to democracy. Now, you can see the calls for this. I, here's a quote from 1990 from one of those many commissions that I was talking about. Um, the case for participation should begin with a normative argument. I think that's, yeah. With a nor that, that a purely technocratic orientation, one that's just looking at safety, for example, um, is incompatible with democratic ideals. And then more, more recently than 1990, 18 years later, the National Research Council echoed this view. Public participation is intrinsic to democratic governance. Now, public engagement can take many forms, town halls, um, public hearings, citizen panels, citizen juries, consensus conferences, focus groups, opinion polls. The, the one that I'm going to focus on most right now is are more deliberative in nature. Um, they aren't just providing information and they aren't just asking for people's static opinion, which can also be reinforcing of polarization if you just ask a static opinion. Um, deliberative engagement begins with the recognition of the underlying values inherent in these problems and focuses on developing mutual understanding and genuine interaction across perspectives. Um, and it, it, ho hopefully it engenders constant adjustment, negotiation, and, and compromise. It requires thinking and respectful listening. It's the opposite of just giving your opinion and leaving it at that. Rather than assuming that members of a democracy have fixed preferences, research on well-designed deliberations shows that people can change their minds, imagine that, in response to new information and better arguments. In this way, when deliberations are well-structured, they can lead to listening and compromise and depolarization. Um, one reason for optimism is that this chance for greater listening and depolarization might be especially true in regard to choices we face in the life sciences because the controversies about the use of emerging biotechnologies actually don't always split along red-blue lines. You can be a progressive or a libertarian and be pro or con aid and dying. So it's kind of interesting that in certain spheres, there's this left-right political divide and that's it. But, I mean, even vaccine denialism. Lots of progressives are the ones who don't want to give their kids stuff. So it's an interesting domain where maybe that gives us an opening to think about this. There's also many, many normative problems, like what do you do when different publics have different views? And what are, and many, many practical pro problems about how to best engage the public. Um, and I thought just, I just mentioned, a f give you a few quick examples near the end here. Um, the, Danish Bureau, the Danish Board of Technology has recognized the importance of deliberation and they do something called Worldwide Views. They bring 100 people together. It's hard to see, but that says Japan, Pakistan, Haiti, and Arizona. Um, they bring groups of 100 people to deliberate and really think these deliberations are highly structured. They're not just opinion fests. There's materials that have been carefully crafted to explain things and, and a way of introducing people to the complexities of the issues and they're helped to um, really to think. Um, there's a whole bunch of other examples. I'm not going to name all of them. I'm just going to bring attention to this. This is a new book by James Fishkin, Democracy When the People Are Thinking. I love that title. Um, Revitalizing Our Politics Through Public Deliberation. Um, and he's used very structured deliberations um, for governments around a lot of political and economic questions. And I've been in having conversations with him about how we could use some of his technologies to gather public opinion about um, human germline modification. And then another, this is a very close to home. It's got to do with what's going on in Nantucket here. Um, 
uh, th these mice carry the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. And uh, Professor Kevin Esfeld at MIT is an evolutionary biologist who wants to modify these mice so that they cannot carry Lyme disease because so many people on Nantucket have been exposed. Forty percent of Nantucket residents have had Lyme. Um, but so anyway, he's been holding, here, here he is, he's been holding public discussions and he has said that he will not go, that MIT will not go forward with these trials unless there's community support for this. And the newspapers have been reporting that people come in angry and distressed that they're not, you know, not going to genetically modify our island and, and then have been developing some much more thoughtfulness about whether maybe this is a good thing, maybe we can do it like, like the National Academies report in some kind of more structured incremental way. So I think these are very promising. Um, the Hastings Center recently received six new grants and all of them are focusing on different kinds of public engagement and I'd be happy to describe some of those in the questions and answers. But I just wanted to mention a couple. Um, maybe for, t for today's purposes, one of the most relevant ones is seed funding that we've received very generously from the Donahue Foundation in Connecticut, which is enabling us to strengthen our communication capacity so that we can reach the public with this information more effectively and in greater numbers. We also have a grant from the Knight Foundation, which is enabling us to consider how best to build discourse about these kinds of dilemmas at the local community level. We've argued in this proposal, and the Knight Foundation is enabling us now. We argued that um, there's, it's one thing for all this polarization to be at the national level, and also there needs to be attention to the global level with the figuring out new strategies for the internet. But let's not forget that most of us know our neighbors, and that community civic innovation at the community level, like Kevin's doing in in Nantucket, could be a way to help us not you know, help us get along in our own backyards. And so we're developing both theory, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, theories of what builds robust civic innovation, and also practical suggestions for sort of best practices. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is, I was really proud that last summer we held a first ever summer teacher workshop. We had teachers from every part of the country. We had people from the, from the southern states talking about how these are science teach high school science teachers talking about how their community was angry that they were teaching evolution and we gave them the skills to use bioethics to help their kids enter these issues with respect and so we we focused the topic the topic was uh, human germline gene editing should we do it that was all the cases we gave them all the background we gave them but the real goal to me wasn't the top wasn't familiarity with the topic the real goal was um, equipping them to use bioethical bio modes of inquiry. So when I talked about the values, those are kind of the content issues that bioethics addresses, if you will. But there's also another part to bioethics that is about how we think, not, not the value, not the content of what things, what principles we want to look at, but there are also bioethical modes of inquiry. Um, for example, bioethics can be used, the, the kind of the ground rules for how we think and talk, which is what we were trying to give as tools to these teachers, um, can counter extreme epistemological relativism and moral relativism. Here, let me just define what I mean by that. Um, epistemological relativism is a notion that you can have your view of something and I can have my view and mine ignores scientific evidence, but it's deeply felt and deeply held and both the views that are based on evidence and the views that are not on any evidence are treated as if equal. That's what I mean by epistemological relativism. And it is a close cousin to moral relativism, where um, an extreme moral relativism. So of course we want to live in a society that accepts that people have different moral visions. But extreme moral relativism is something different. It's where we have given up on the idea. We've just say, you have your view, I have my view, everything is okay, it's all the same, which basically is giving up on the idea that we can argue and discern and come up with rationales and um, distinguish better from worse um, reasons and better from worse outcomes. And that's what I'm hoping these teachers came away with some tools 
not only to talk about germline editing, as interesting and important as it is, but also some tools to help their kids get beyond, you have your view, I have mine, that's it. Um, and, and we gave them lots and lots of practical strategies and what to do when kids say stuff like that. So I don't know any other solution other, you know, outside of politics um, to, uh, that we can't give up on these things that enrich our, our civic life. So I gave you some examples. I also think there's plenty of opportunity for this to just happen in the regular, in the media, in the in literature, in films, in the arts, through novels, movies, and television. And so the the rubric public participation is absolutely fundamental to how we can dig our way out of this polarization. And when you think about social change and the times when we really have had a large-scale public conversation about which direction our society should go in, the discussion has gone beyond scholarly elites. Um, and it's found a way into public awareness through movies and books and, and other ways. That's been true of the women's movement. It's been true of civil rights. It's true of gay marriage. Maybe even becoming true of end-of-life care, where there's much more discussion about aid and dying than there used to be. These are big social movements, and they develop well beyond academia and the world of policy elites. They become successful in part because of discussion in television shows, movies, and novels, as well as in more structured places like schools or deliberative forums. So that's my prescription. Um, you can judge whether it's too Pollyanna or not. Let me just end by summing up kind of what, what, I, what I've tried to do. So I began with the notion that we humans have enormous new powers and that we have to figure out how to use them wisely. To do that, we need to develop both soft and hard governance. And the soft and hard governance needs to aim to answer four questions. To develop it or not, for what purpose, in what manner, incrementally or not, and with what oversight. And then to answer those questions, I've tried to give examples that include safety, but go way beyond safety to issues that we don't often talk about with as much vigor as we do safety. And I've tried to give some examples of what those are. And then my next move was to say that experts, including scientists, bioethicists, and other kinds of scholars are critical for presenting the options for, for bring, making these values explicit, for making the value trade-offs explicit so we can clearly see what's at stake, for proposing recommendations, that's, uh, experts need to weigh in on that, and for creating a respectful space for dialogue in the way that we taught those teachers how to do that. But if we're to nurture our democracy, we must also build an informed citizenry and then commit to really listening and really engaging with one another, expert and non-expert alike. Given that there's no one public, but many different publics with many different views, the path to meaningful democratic participation is going to engender strong differences of opinion. But that is exactly why we have to embrace the dialogue. And very soon, thank you.